East African Asian cooking or Afro-Asian cooking has hardly been explored. We're twice removed migrants and each migration has a food story. I find it um, quite sad that so much of that history, which has got Arab, Indian, Swahili, uh, Chinese influences, as we merged into East Africa and then we moved here, the food is extraordinarily complex, uh, multicultural fusion, but very much itself, there is such a thing as East African Asian food. And there are places you can go to where you eat it. So, if you look at this, uh, my two spice boxes, in some ways they're very um, familiar now to people here. You know, it seems like a box of Indian spices, and it, it is. But there are big differences. The two key powders in this, the um, uh, Daraji, or what we call uh, the main curry powder we use almost for everything, is made in different proportions and in a very East African way. You can always taste an East African curry because it's much more mellow. We don't use a lot of different spices in the curry powder. It's quite simple. And then the garam masala too is made very specifically and it's completely different from the Pakistani version or the Indian version or the South African version. It is very particular to Uganda. Now remember, we were in East Africa. Zanzibar is where cloves uh, were grown by slaves, as it happened. So the, the, a lot of cloves are used because they were cheap. Cinnamon grew everywhere on the coast. That is used a lot because it was cheap. Um, so sometimes it's to do with what grew around there. But one thing about East African or Afro-Asian food is it's never ever as greasy or as loaded with spices or as heavy as subcontinental food. It just isn't. Um, it's much lighter. Actually, if I could put it, uh, the nearest to this way to describe it would be if you could Indianize Italian food. That's the kind of taste it is. A lot of tomato is used, a lot of fresh vegetables, um, but it isn't drowning in the spices. It's very light and um, kind of dependent on um, you not dying of hot chilies, or, but actually feeling you know, in the middle of a very lovely poem each time you eat. You know, it doesn't want to blow your senses. Our food never blows your senses. The staple food in Uganda, uh, the starch, is mutoke. And almost every villager when I was there, every, every person had their little plot where there would always be a mutoke tree. And people used to say, you know, if you, if you put a walking stick into the earth in Uganda, a mutoke tree will grow. And I remember when we started getting this here, it's about, I would reckon, six, seven years ago, we finally started getting them here. This is cassava, the second big starch um, that people eat in East Africa. You can now buy it frozen in many shops. You parboil it, which is what I've done, in water which has some salt and a bit of lemon juice added. And then you take it out when it's still quite firm. And I'm now going to fry it as you would chips. And these are like chips with a slightly different taste. And when, once they're fried, we eat them with tamarind sauce. Um, and it's a great tea time snack. The great thing is, though they got rid of Ugandan Asians from Uganda, the local population, especially in the cities, in the towns, learnt our way of cooking their food. And so if you go there now, they're making matoke the Indian way, which just shows how food connects people long after history is part of them. And the same goes with Israel, Palestine and so on. Their food is the same. If only they kind of could understand that.